In my last video, I debuted my first 3D printed product and lots of you were interested in the prototyping process. So if you're not interested, I'll see you on my next video. If you are, I hope this video will help answer some of your questions. To start, I didn't come up with this idea. The original rail hinge and MFT table as a whole product was created by Festool sometime in the early 2000s, I believe. And since then, there have been lots of versions that you can purchase. Each one has its perks and would be great options, but I prefer to make stuff. So when it came time to decide on a hinge for my MFT, I thought I was going to make one out of plywood and just use a simple door hinge. So this was prototype number one. Honestly, at this point, I was really just excited about the workbench and I could have made this hinge work, but right about this time was when I got my 3D printer. There are a ton of files you can download to 3D print without knowing how to draw in CAD software, but I wanted to be able to use my 3D printer to its fullest potential. So I binge watched Fusion 360 tutorials for a week straight. I found that the best series was called Learn Fusion 360 in 30 Days. It's 30 short videos that are easily digestible. Day 20 of those videos was about designing printable hinges, and I literally felt the light bulb go off in my head. So I binge watched every other Fusion 360 hinge tutorial video I could find, and I spent a whole day designing this. I thought it was so cool that a hinge could print in place like this without needing to assemble it. So now the workbench took a back seat, and my whole focus just shifted to working on this. But you can hear how squeaky this is and there's a ton of play. So there was a lot of tweaking ahead of me. The key to making a print in place hinge work is designing the tolerances or spaces between the parts. The gap needs to be big enough that the parts won't print stuck together and it needs to be small enough that there won't be any unnecessary movements between the parts. The space needs to be just right. So nailing in that Goldilocks zone spacing was key. I only discovered this after the fact, but Maker World, which is Bamboo Labs user-driven website where people upload their own designs and anyone can download them for free, has a few tolerance test files that you can print to test this tolerance on your own printer. One that would have been super helpful if I knew it existed was this print in place tolerance test specifically for hinges. When using a Bamboo Lab printer, printing files for Maker World is just a one-click process. If you're browsing Maker World on your computer, just click Open in Bamboo Studio, and the file is loaded into the slicer ready to be printed. Even if you're nowhere near a computer, you can print files straight from your phone in the Bamboo Handy app. Press Prepare to Print, and in no time, your print will be ready. This tolerance tester is a bunch of different hinges printed with different spacing between the parts so you can test what sort of fit you like. These are too loose, and this one has just the right amount of resistance. I could have also designed this print-in-place hinge tester in Fusion 360 with more custom spacing for my project. I seriously wish that I saw this file before printing my first hinge. And there are other really cool tolerance test files on Maker World as well. Anyway, moving on, I read somewhere that it's best to print hinges in this orientation. So I tried this out and I really liked the resistance that I was getting, but printing it in this orientation led me down a whole rabbit hole that ended up wasting a couple days of my life. Well, lots of lessons were learned, so maybe not such a huge waste. The reason why I like the resistance on this so much is because of the overhangs. I don't know if this is coming across on camera, but you can see these lines on the bottom of each hinge. That's material that's technically an overhang, meaning it was not supported by any other material. So as it's being printed, it droops down to the closest layer below it. And because of that, the gap between the parts closes up and it makes for a really smooth motion. So I thought this was definitely the way I was gonna print it. And I moved on to some other details like I realized if I uh, printed it this way and mounted it on the side of a table, the hinge is rotating in the wrong direction because it's supposed to hinge backwards like this. So it lifts up and lifts the track saw rail out of the way. So instead of having this top hinge piece directly on top of the bottom piece, I shifted the whole hinge over so it can go backwards and tilt the rail back but I feared this wasn't going to tilt the rail far back enough and the heavier rail will fall forward. 
So I offset the hinge even more so that the rail would be completely vertical when lifted up. I'm sure some of you can see the design flaw in this already, but I thought that this was it. So I went ahead and printed a super solid version based off of this design. The biggest problem with this design is that it leaves no room for the hardware when in this position. The solution to that was just to offset the hinge even more. Now there is a gap when it's fully open so hardware can fit in between. And this arch here makes this area super strong. But this version tilted up in this way. And there's really no reason for it to do that. It actually might be a problem when setting the rail height. So I moved the hinge to the bottom of this piece and elongated it so that it stops in the correct position for the rail to be flat and straight. Now that was sorted out, but remember I mentioned that waste of time rabbit hole I went down because I wanted to print this hinge on the side. I really love the resistance of how the hinge felt when printing on the side like this, but there are a few key elements to this that were problematic when printing it this way. The support pin and the mounting slot. Both of these parts have an overhang when printed in this orientation, meaning there's no material underneath it to support it. You can see how this pin printed without any support and the slot did not print well either. 3D printers are kind of like magic, how they print items out of thin air, but they can't actually print on air. Overhangs need support. I know I could just click enable support in my slicer, but in my head I was designing this for mass production and there was a big problem with that. All the hinges are technically overhangs as well. So if I enabled support in my slicer, it added support to the hinge parts also, and that would be a pain to remove for mass production. Bamboo Studio has the option to paint in areas where you want or don't want supports. So I was able to unpaint the hinge portion and it worked fine for me. But again, I was thinking about mass production and I sent the file off to a 3D print farm that doesn't have that sort of control when they enable supports. So I really wanted to design supports that would be built into the file so you don't have to check off enable supports in your slicer. Days. I spent days testing out different types of supports. First, I started with the slot. I figured just adding thin material going vertically along the slot would work. And I figured the end user could easily remove these when they get their hinge. But the first sample I tested out was really hard and annoying to remove. You can see this version of the hinge also has these triangle cutouts. I thought it would save on time and material. It didn't really make a difference, so I tossed that idea. I wisened up and instead of printing the entire hinge to test out more supports, I printed just the overhang portions starting with the slot. I didn't just come up with this idea for built-in supports by myself. In one of my designing for 3D printing binge sessions, I came across a YouTube channel called Slant 3D and he has a ton of videos about designing products for 3D printing, specifically designing for mass production. His videos were super helpful in nailing down the details of my final design. Anyway, the first shape I tested was this teardrop shape that was connected to the material with a very fine line. I printed multiple with different amounts of supports, but I found these were kind of hard to remove. So I nixed the teardrop shape and just went with a simple fine line like I had before and printed a couple to see how many supports I actually needed for the span overhang I had in the slot. Turns out I didn't need too many. Three was totally enough and easy to remove and the bolt still fit. The pin was more interesting to figure out. I tried so many options for this. I'm not gonna go into detail over each one because I didn't end up using any of these in the end. The reason I'm showing them at all is just to show you that the design process is not a straight line. Sometimes you need to go down a rabbit hole that leads you to a dead end just so that you could turn right back around then finally figure out the direction you need to go. In this case, I did not find light at the end of the tunnel. I found another rabbit hole called mouse ears. I finally picked a support that I liked, a hollow box that had small bits of thin material to support the overhang. But every time I went to print it, the small hollow box came loose from the bed. And there was even one time where I made the entire top piece of the hinge hollow by accident. The problem with the small little hollow support was that there was very little material on the first layer, so I was having adhesion problems. I thought 
mouse ears was going to be the solution to this. If you're familiar with 3D printing at all, you'll be familiar with the concept of a brim. A brim is a layer of material that's printed around the base of the object you're printing to improve adhesion and reduce warping. In my slicer, Bamboo Studio, you can make custom brims any size you want, and it's super helpful. But again, I was thinking about mass production and removing an entire brim would be really tedious for people who are handling shipping of the product or the end user. So mouse ears do the same thing as a brim using less material and man hours. They're basically little circles that sit at the corners of your object and they help keep it down because there's more surface area. I spent a stupidly long amount of time designing these in Fusion 360 so that they were supporting the corners and the little hollow support box. I finally had a successful print with the supports and I was super excited. I thought I nailed it and this was it. I tested some other ways to print the bracket like on an angle like this, but I didn't think it made a difference. So I stuck with the original way and now I just need to design the front support pin. I got a good idea when I printed the hollow one by accident. To save on time and material, I printed the initial design hollow just so that I could nail down the shape. I really wish that I'd done this with the hinge as well. To get the shape on the support pin, I just made the top portion the same width as the hinge, then brought it in narrower at the bottom so it can rest in the bracket. Now this bracket, because it's surrounding the narrower portion, it's smaller than the bracket for the hinge. And I didn't like this. <laughs> I didn't like that the set would have two different size brackets. And I realized that the bracket for the hinge did not need to be this big. So I kept the smaller bracket and I narrowed the bottom portion of the hinge and made these little triangle shoulders that <laughs> match the triangles on the new support pin I designed. And now they both fit into the same bracket file that has this angle cut out at the top. Can anyone see the problem that I caused by making this portion more narrow? When printing on its side, this whole area needs support. I tried so many different ways to design custom supports for this section in Fusion, and none of them were good. I found the best and easiest way to do support in this area was to use the tree supports that are built into my slicer settings. Even though it worked, I didn't like how it looked. And again, that mass production problem with enabling supports. I don't remember what caused me to make this decision, but I decided to try printing it on its back in this orientation. This way required zero supports, even the built-in ones that I'd spent so much time on and it printed out perfectly. But now that it wasn't printing on its side anymore, I wasn't getting that same resistance that was created by the overhangs of the hinge. So I did a bunch more testing with the tolerances, this time only printing out a small section each time to test the functionality. And finally, finally, I got that movement I was after, and this is the final design of the hinge. After this, I made one small little tweak with the bracket. Instead of holes, I made elongated slots. So it's compatible with more tables, and this is the final design. I also worked pretty hard on designing this flip stop hinge, lots of versions to try to get this perfect snap lock enclosure to ensure it won't move. Why am I making this video? Besides for the fact that a few people asked me to, I also wanted to share how getting this 3D printer has completely changed the way I think about my business. And if you're a woodworker or creator in general, I hope you're able to see the value that this little 3D printer has already brought into my shop. Designing a product for mass production was not new to me. I designed this six in one jig a couple years ago and the process was months of back and forth between Jonathan and I, where we would tweak designs here and there. We would wait for samples of hardware to come in. He would ship them out to me. I would test, I would make a tweak. He would cut something out new. I would have to wait for him to send that out again. Then I would make another tweak months. This hinge on the other hand, from the moment I printed the first test hinge, to the final product was just a couple of weeks. And that was only possible because I have a 3D printer in my shop. There was another idea that I came up with right after the six in one jig that kind of just got dropped because the back and forth of me waiting for someone else to manufacture a prototype was annoying. The process was taking too long and I just got busy with other things. But now that I have my own prototyping tool, I think I could turn that into a final product and probably 
five days, maybe less, and I will after I build my kids some desks. Um, to be honest, I kind of always thought that 3D printing was like a nerdy, geeky thing where people just printed Star Wars figurines. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just not my thing. And I didn't realize that getting a 3D printer would open up this whole other side of my business. And I also didn't realize how many people are already making a living off of 3D printing as well. Go on Etsy and just search vase. The first listing that pops up is a 3D printed vase. And I'm sure if I keep scrolling, lots more 3D printed items will pop up. People are making a killing on Etsy selling 3D printed products, and it's so easy for anyone with a 3D printer to set up shop and just start selling. I have also ordered some specialty woodworking things lately, and I didn't know they were 3D printed until they arrived. Like this bandsaw tension gauge. Once it arrived, I saw the layer lines and I was like, oh cool, this guy developed this product in his shop and now he's able to mass produce them and make a living off of it. Super cool. I know this whole video is about me designing my own product using CAD software, which seems pretty daunting if that doesn't come easy to you. And it seems like it may come easy to me from this video, but it doesn't. <laughs> I have to Google how to do things many, many times throughout the modeling process. But if a program like Fusion still feels complicated to you, but you still wanna get into 3D printing, I highly recommend looking into a Bamboo Lab machine because you can get started printing without needing to know anything about Fusion or any complicated 3D modeling software. Yes, this is sponsored, but let me show you guys something really cool. On the Maker World website, there's something called Maker Lab. Here you can find modeling tools to easily customize designs. Take a vase, for example. All you have to do is drag and click to create really cool shapes. Then download the file and bring it into Bamboo Studio, the slicer. Here you can make even more changes by just clicking and dragging. You can also customize any existing design in the bamboo slicer. Take these cutting board templates, for example. You can modify them in Bamboo Studio to fit the project you're working on. I wouldn't suggest selling other people's modified designs as a finished 3D printed product, but designing something completely unique is totally possible in Bamboo Studio. If you right click, you'll find a drop down menu to add a primitive. Here you can add shapes to your plate, adjust to the sizes necessary, then do a Boolean operation to combine or remove any of the shapes created. Add some text and you have a jig ready to print. In my last video, I told you guys a story about helping my friend with her 3D printer that was not in a bamboo lab and she was using a different slicer that had none of these capabilities or if they did have them, they were not easy to find or figure out. Bamboo Studio is the most user-friendly slicer especially in combination with the Bamboo Handy app. I'm not an expert at 3D printing, but the user-friendly design of Bamboo Studio and the machine's auto calibration feature are the only reasons why I was able to quickly dive in and create a usable product in just a couple of weeks. The Bamboo Lab A1 Combo is already an incredibly affordable machine, and now is the perfect time to grab one with all the holiday deals available. It outputs high quality prints and is the only printer in its price range capable of doing multicolor prints. Plus there are fantastic discounts on various types of filaments right now. If you're a beginner, I recommend starting out with PLA, which will cover most of the items you wanna print. Then you can move up to PETG, which is a tougher, harder material that could withstand outdoor use. And then there's also TPU, which prints out flexible, soft, squishy items. So fun. This video is directly targeted towards people who are interested in growing parts of their business in ways that they may not have considered. But I hope going through the prototyping process was also helpful for anyone who just wants to make stuff for themselves. That's cool too. It's awesome to have a tool in my shop that I can use to create custom fixtures and jigs for my personal projects. And I'm also able to design jigs and fixtures for your projects. Speaking of those jigs, when I launched the video on this hinge, I announced that I was selling them as a full package with all the hardware and everything you need to use it. But I was bombarded with hundreds of emails asking to offer the file for sale as well. I asked anyone who emailed me what they thought a fair price was and decided to list the file on my website using their suggestions as a pricing guide. So. Links down below if you're interested. I was worried about the hinge not working correctly on other people's printers, so I included a test hinge that you can print 
to dial in your printer settings before printing the whole thing. I know this wasn't my typical video, but I hope it was insightful for anyone who's interested in getting started with 3D printing. Huge thanks to Bamboo Lab for sponsoring this video. Clearly, I am obsessed and I'm already thinking about getting a second printer. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one. I'm gonna pause because the mailman's here. This is the weird thing about my job. It's very weird. Like you realize that you're talking to yourself, to a camera when other people stop by. All right, he's gone.